I want to go back to Hebrews today and um, want to read in the second chapter, although we're uh, going to be looking at uh, some of the earlier verses along with the uh, with the chapter that we talked a little bit about some of them last week as we uh, as we went through this. Uh, but we're uh, uh, but I want to start with verse nine and read through the rest of the chapter today. That's Hebrews chapter 2, beginning at verse 9. If you have your Bible, uh, you can read along with us. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren." saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church, will I bring praise unto thee. And again I will put my trust in him, and again behold I and the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be merciful, be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Now, we recognize from these verses of Scripture, last week as we were talking about them just a little bit on Sunday night, we made mention in particular with verse 3 in the second chapter where it said how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation. I told you all a little story about how that a man saw a note on the road that said uh, so many pounds 6,000 I think it was pounds to the person who can answer this question and then when the man picked it up the question was how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation. The reality is that we can. That's the only way. And we recognize that. But in what we're looking at, we, uh, we recognize as we begin to look into Hebrews that Hebrews is about Jesus. It's totally about Him. It's about who He is. And in that, it is a letter to the Hebrews, to the Jewish people, to those that have grown up knowing the law, knowing something about what God required as He spoke to Moses, and as they went through those first five books, and as they recognized the things that God desired them to know, the commandments, the rules, the regulations, all of those things, But all of those things were a prelude to who Jesus is and what Jesus can do and does do in our life. And so it begins by talking about who Jesus is to begin with. It says this time, you know, He has spoken unto us through His Son. And then He goes on and says that God called Him. He said, Thy... That uh, unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Speaking about him as who he is, who came in the flesh. 
And he talks about him as the creator. As he says, he laid the foundation at the very beginning and the heavens are the works of thy hands. And, and he speaks about him and saying, you know, all of those things can pass away. All of those things will. And as we saw, as we studied and looked through the book of Revelation, we recognize that eventually there is going to be a new heavens and a new earth. But in that new heavens and new earth, we still have that same Jesus. We still have that same one who came and did all the things it speaks about as we look in these chapters, okay? And then it speaks about him as being greater than. And we're going to see as we go through the book of Hebrews that over and over it begins to tell us how he is greater than this and this and this and this. And in all of these things, speaking about Jesus. And uh, so to begin with, he spoke about the angels. He said, he speaks of, now you know when we talk about the angels, and we talk about their uh, their occupation and the thing that God uses them for. Now, you know, uh, we've, uh, we've spoken about it in one place or another and speaking about what the word angel means. It begins to begin with the messenger is, uh, is the topic and the title. And oftentimes when we see that, sometimes it has one meaning and another. But we're talking about spiritual beings. We're talking about those that... Now, you know, there was one place in the Bible where it talked about an angel that was that destroyed an army, uh, the whole thing in uh, just in, in a day. Okay, he had, you know, we're, and there are thousands and millions of angels that were t that out there. There are the Bible says the angels of the Lord encamp around those that fear Him. The Bible teaches us that all around us uh, there are spiritual beings that we can't see. There is an invisible world as well as a visible world. There is an invisible world that fights against us. There is an invisible world that supports and helps us. They're, they're there. They're, uh, and they're in this room right now. Okay? We may not be able to see them, but that doesn't change the reality of the fact that they are here. Okay? God is here. God is everywhere. And the reality is that He is in this room as well. He is here uh, to touch your life and to touch my life. And, and uh, so we're, we're, these are things that we're talking about. But it says that the angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister. Now what that means is talking about service, okay? It's talking about a servant of God. It's talking about doing the things that God desires. It's, it's talking about making a difference and helping those who have trusted and believe in Jesus Christ. Now, that's, that's a reality. We don't see it. We don't know all about it. We don't. I, I remember a story of my, of my pastor years ago, and I may have told you all this. I don't remember, but, uh, but he was, uh, uh, he, was uh, uh, he, he drove up uh, to the railroad track on the, on the east end of town, um, and he was sitting there and fixing to go across the railroad track in a car, uh, 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 pulled right out or whatever, and he said, "Well, I didn't see that car." And and the person uh, sitting, uh, standing out next to his window said, uh, uh, "Said you didn't see that train either, did you?" And the train went by, and and uh, he always believed that somehow God uh, did that to keep him from uh, going across that track. God, uh, and without question, protects us in ways that we have no idea about, and. Uh, you know, sometimes we are delayed and we get aggravated and we're upset because we get delayed and we don't know what God may have protected us from through that delay. But in all of those things, what we're looking at here, we're looking at Jesus. Jesus is the message. Jesus is what it's about. And it says here, we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for suffering. Now right now, in this place and in this time angels have far more power than what we can even imagine with ourselves. We are, we are mortal. We are human. We, uh, we are facing what every human being faces. If Jesus doesn't come back first, we're going to die someday. Okay? Death will come. That, that's a reality. It is appointed unto man once to die. And so we see this that it says about Jesus. It says who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. He came here that he might go through what he did. He came here that 
that he might die for us. That's the reality of it. But more than just death, there's more to it than that as we go through and we look at these things. It said, but Jesus, we see Jesus who was made lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things. Everything is Jesus. It's everything. That's what it says. Okay. And by whom are, are all things. By him came everything into existence. Okay. He is the one over there where it says, plainly and simply, Thou Lord in the beginning hast laid the foundations. It plainly speaks and says that he is the one through whom all things came into existence. He is uh, he is the one that holds things together. That's, that's who Jesus is. He's, he's, he's more than anything that we can possibly imagine, okay? He says, And by whom all things uh, are all things in bringing many sons to glory. I, I love that song that I think that uh, the ladies may have sang uh, some day, weeks back where it, where it says, uh, where it tells, uh, 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 talking about uh, uh, how deep the Father's love is, okay? How deep the Father's love for us, uh, vast beyond all measure. And and the light, and that first verse ends by, it says, by bringing many sons to glory. And that and it comes right out of these verses. It comes from right here. This is, this is where that came from. And it says that it wasn't just dying. Uh, somebody took this verse of Scripture and was talking about it and said, well, just suppose, that Jesus had came to earth as a full grown man. Just suppose for a minute that he was only here about a, a week's time and he preached the gospel message to everybody during that week and at the end of the week they killed him on the cross. Innocent without ever having committed any sin. Would his blood have paid for our sins? Of course it would have. Okay. But the question then is, would he, as a son of a man, he as a human being, he is dying on a cross, he is doing these things, would he understand the fullness of everything that we go through? Well, God certainly understands everything. But in this it says that there was a reason behind all of this, that every one of these things that Jesus went through, he did it in order that he would indeed, how as it says it, to make the capital of perfect through suffering for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Now down here at the bottom it says he, he himself has suffered being tempted he is able to suffer them that are tempted. In other words, he went through all these things that when you face something whatever it is you face he understands because he's been through it. He understands because he faced it himself. He knows what it is to be tempted. He knows what it is to be hungry. He knows what it is to be thirsty. He knows what it is to walk on a hot uh, day in a dusty trail and to and to feel the heat and uh, and everything that you do. He knows these things because he went through these things. Because he came here and became man at, to understand everything about what it means to be man. To know all about it. To face all of these things and to reach that point where innocent as he was, with no sin at all, in any sense of the word or in any way, that he would be put to death on that cross as a sacrifice that paid for you and me. It says, He should taste death for every man. Okay? And so he says these things. And in it, he comes down here and he says, For as much then as the children, he talks about the children, he talks about us, he talks about who we are. And he says that he's not ashamed to call us his brethren. Well, I'll tell you what, that's, a, that's amazing that one who never sinned, who never did anything wrong, who obeyed the law completely, who was able to accomplish all of that, who was 
like Adam before sin ever entered into the world. Sin is a disease. Sin is a genetic disorder. Sin is something that we are inclined to do. Sin is a nature that we have from our fathers. Sin is... Uh, we, we, we will automatically... You know, there was a story I was reading this week. I, I don't even remember what it was about or why that I was reading it, but it may have had something to do with my literature class or whatever. But, but in it, it talked about a man that, uh, that had uh, uh, willed his farm to the devil. He died and he gave his farm to the devil in his will. And so it came before the judge to do a probate about it. And he says, how do you do such a thing as this? And he says, and finally the judge says, the only thing I know to do is let the farm just grow up in weeds and thistles and thorns and everything else. Said that, said that, that, that would do it. And in the process of it, he, made, he was making the statement that if you leave a child to its own, if you don't teach it the difference between right and wrong, if you let it make its own decisions no matter what, it's going to grow up doing wrong. It's going to go that way. It's going to go in that direction because a child needs direction for truth. A child needs a direction for what is right and what is wrong. A child needs to be taught what's right and wrong. A child needs to know the Word of God. And He needs you to teach it to that child. Okay? That's the thing, you see. We automatically, the Bible says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. The Bible makes it plain that given our own without any help from God, that we will automatically go in the wrong direction. We need God to make a difference in our life. We need God to change us, to give us new life. We need those things. And so, he speaks about it here as he says, for as much then the children, you know, talking about calling us brethren, he calls us brethren, and in this he calls us then the children, that's us, are partakers of flesh and blood. Every one of us was born mortal. We're born human beings. We're born in the flesh. We walk the way that we uh, that uh, that men walk, and we die the way that men die. We do all of those things. But it says he also himself likewise took part of the same. Okay, he came here. As a man, born a baby, growing up as a child, <coughs> becoming a man, that he might go through everything we go through and die the way that he did, to be that sacrifice. <coughs> that he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels. He wasn't, he wasn't an angel while he was here. He wasn't a spirit being while he was here. He was God who came in the flesh. He was both God and man, and that's a mystery to us how that can be, but he, that's who he was. He was, he was man, and he was God at the same time. And he says... Wherefore, he took them on, on him, not, not, not the other, not angels, not the power of an angel, not all of those things. He became a man. He became a man that he would suffer and bleed and die for you and for me. Now, there are several things that... that it says here in these verses that it teaches us. One is he became a man to reclaim our lost destiny. Now the Bible tells us that what 
God said to Adam what he did for Adam was he gave him authority over all of his creation. Read the, read the first part of Genesis and see that. But because of sin, Adam forfeited his right to rule. Okay? Jesus came exactly the way Adam was, with no nature to sin, no wrong in him, nothing at all, and he overcame and did not do any sin or any wrong or anything about that, but he died innocently for us. That's what it teaches us here. He became man to reclaim our lost destiny, and he is, as it plainly says, when he speaks about it, he says he would put everything under his feet, that he would be king, that he would be crowned with glory, that he would inherit all things, that he would, all of these things, and he would call us brethren, that we may inherit with him. Because he became a man, that that may be the case. What we lost through disobedience, he regained by his obedience, even to the death on the cross. He entered the human race to become part of it. He experienced death for every one of us. He became a man to restore our lost relationship with God. And the work he came to do was not only to die, but as our go-between to understand what we go through. Not just as God, but as a human being. He became man to restore us to release us from our present bondage to destroy now what it says when it talks about death now God is in control he's in control of everything it is God's determination when the time will come for us to die not the devil's okay you read that in the book of Job when he says you can do anything you want to to him but you can't kill him okay he doesn't have that power okay so when we talk about death, we talk about the absence of life. You know, we talk about, uh, and life only really comes through Christ, okay? Uh, but it means to render, uh, to destroy means to render impotent, to nullify, to make it inconsequential, to make what the devil tries to do of none effect in our life because we have Jesus. So he came to restore us in times of failure, to make our life better than what it is without Him. And when we come to Him, this is a good way that somebody put it. He said, if we come defending our sins, defiant and excusing ourselves, we can find no help at all. If we come defined of what God's will is and what God's word says, we don't find any help. But if we come confessing, pouring it all out, casting it all upon Him, we find healing and we find grace. See, that's the difference. When you come to God, you must come to God recognizing your lostness. When you come to God, you must understand the fact that you've been a sinner. You don't come to God defending your sins, you come to God turning loose of your sins. You don't come to God saying, this is what I want it to be. You come to God saying, what is it you want of me? You come to God presenting yourself and giving yourself to Him. And you don't say, this is what I'm going to do, God. You say, what is it you want me to do, God? There's a difference in the manner in which we come and our attitude that we come toward God. If we come defiant, we can't find salvation. If we come repentant, then we find grace and we find mercy and we find Jesus. And 
that verse becomes all important. Where it says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? You see, there's only one way of salvation. And if we neglect that way, there isn't any other way. There isn't any other stairs. There isn't any way, uh, another way to go. You can't climb over the wall. There's a song that says, you can't climb over it. You can't get under it. You must come in at the door. And the door, plainly and simply, is Jesus. Amen. He's the way. And so, as we look at this, and I'm going to finish up with this. Jesus became a man to regain our inheritance, to recover our relationship, to release us from bondage, to restore us in our weakness and our infirmities, to plainly and simply uh, take away the fear of death and the fear of everything that has anything to do with it and to give us life in Him. That's what we're talking about. That's who Jesus is. So, have you recognized who He is? He became man and He died to give you life. Have you trusted Him? Have you given yourself to Him? Father, once again, we come to you right now knowing that it is in Jesus and Jesus alone that we have life and hope and direction and everything we need, love, and all of it, it comes from you. Lord, I pray that even now in this moment, if there is one that is lost under the sound of my voice, wherever they might be, Lord, I pray that they would come to know Jesus as their own personal Savior, that he might call them brethren as he calls those who have already come to know him and to trust him in Jesus' name.